Okay, let's let's get started. Some of your friends ask a question, which I believe you should also hear the answer. Um, how you should get in contact with the embassies? I strongly recommend you to first of all locate the um, sort of uh, contact information of the embassies. These are available everywhere. In the you can just look up on the internet or find from other sources. Uh, where is uh, their address, their phone numbers, and more specifically, as uh, the first step, their email address. They are usually an uh, info type, info at, uh, say, uh, US Embassy or state.gov or whatever it is, uh, type of email addresses where you can send your request. And since too many other different requests might be sent to that particular email address by many, many other people, uh, the likelihood for your email to be located and to be sent to the relevant person is not very high because possibly they are getting maybe hundreds of emails every day. So someone should check these emails. Uh, depending on the embassies we're talking about, maybe Israeli or Americans may be receiving more, some for protests, some for insults, some for requests, whatever. I mean, the internet is not always something that makes your life easy. Sometimes it may make your life very difficult. I have to spend half an hour every day to clean up my inbox, uh, the spams and everything. Otherwise, your inbox is inflated and it may explode at one point. Anyway, so please make sure you have an email address of the embassy and what you do is to go ahead and write an email explaining your situation that you are a student here at Bilkent University International Relations Department and that you are taking this course and please write explicitly and in complete sentences not the way you write to me okay I'm your uh, instructor here professor I may tolerate some you know writing mistakes but when you write a request to an embassy uh, you should first impress these people with your writing and, and explaining the situation clearly. You are IR uh, student here and taking this IR 343 because they will most possibly be checking our website and see tr uh, if there is such and such uh, course being offered by me. Uh, uh, embassies are sort of uh, here to do a, a number of jobs, one of which is intelligence and also serve their countries as, and in many respects, one of which is security. So they will most possibly double check before they return to you by an email or by calling you. So please write everything in clear uh, sort of format, explain the situation and what exactly you want. So for this, of course, you will be uh, needing a specific title, which I will give you the latest on Friday and uh, most possibly by the time we meet on Friday, you will have the subject matter. So don't rush to write uh, to the embassies before Friday and until such time you get together and, and try to sort of get to know each other if you don't know already and what kind of uh, uh, sort of a job assignments each one of you will have in terms of sharing the burden. But once you write an email explaining the situation, and placing your request clearly, uh, of course, you should be asking specific questions or you should be explaining as to what exactly you expect from them to do. Because sometimes these embassy people call me or send an email to me telling me, well, we got an email from one of your students, but we're not clear what exactly he or she wants. So please don't let them make this again and write your uh, statement clearly make your request known or understood properly so that you know, these people might start thinking about how to help you out. So this first step. And secondly, unless you hear from the embassy within a week or 10 days or so via email or, and of course, please provide them with a number of uh, email addresses, each one of you, and also uh, your phone numbers so that they can return to you maybe by phone or if you like you can also give them a mailing address they may want to see some documents brochures or maybe some written material etc so 
uh, if you don't hear from these people within a reasonable time, like a week or 10 days, make sure you call them. And, if, and, and of course, once you call an embassy, you usually you know, have a person on the other side of the line, someone at the switchboard, who doesn't know much about what is going on in the embassy, and they usually are Turkish citizens who are working in foreign embassies for facilitating their communication with ins and, uh, from uh, within to outside and from outside to the embassy people. So explain the situation and tell them that you send an email with such and such request and you would like to talk to the person who might help out. And they will most possibly put you through to the uh, spokesperson of the embassy, I mean person in charge of uh, press and meeting the press request, etc. or may maybe cultural attaché or other type of diplomats from lower ranks most possibly. You may or may not have access to the amb uh, ambassador at first, but if you uh, uh, sort of establish this contact over the phone, and if you cannot still get someone uh, uh, on the other end of the line, all you have to do is to go to the embassy. And um, embassies are usually crowded during the morning because people apply for visas. You may still go there in the morning or by checking the embassy's you know, working hours, opening hours, you can go in the afternoon when most people are not there or just waiting for their visas that may have been issued for them. So then you can explain to the person at the gate and they will possibly call upon someone and that person will come to the gate and you can sort of meet face to face. So therefore, different embassies may have different applications but what is uh, something that will facilitate your task is that these embassies, because I picked up the very same countries, uh, just uh, the ones that uh, I chose uh, in the previous simulations, ambassadors and the diplomats at the lower ranks in, in between uh, are familiar with this course, with me, and with this kind of request from them. So in most likelihood, they will not be surprised uh, by getting such a request from you. They should be sort of familiar with this request, but in all likelihood, all you have to do is to use your personal skills in terms of you know, uh, facilitating this communication between you and the embassy people and get as much information as possible. And again, let me repeat, the information that will be given to you, that will be supplied to you somehow, either maybe a written text, or some you know, parts of uh, different speeches that you can just work them out and you know, prepare your own statement. They may all help you out the most for the first session of the simulation where each country will represent its uh, sort of position vis-a-vis -vis that particular subject within four or five minutes at most. Considering that we have 11 countries and there will be time between each country to start and stop, etc. So we will have we will have to devote our first se first session for this. The information that the embassies will give you, as I said, will be enough maybe for the first session. But for the second session, where there may be some cross words or, or, or a cross fire of words, I mean there will be accusations. Uh, by some countries, uh, about other countries of something, and there will be some propositions put on the table, you will have to respond to that, and the, your uh, sort of responses uh, to this kind of uh, situations will determine a significant proportion of your p performance, and, and therefore the grade that you will get out of the simulation. So therefore you should uh, somehow uh, extend the scope of your research do not confine yourselves to the stuff that will be given to you or that will come to you from embassies. This is a significant and important part, but not all. So you have to make your research throughout the semester. You will have to go and read some books, articles, and think tank publications. All right, I think uh, we can go back to our uh, session that we, where we were talking about major characteristics of the Middle East. All right, I think the uh, simulation issue and op-ed issues, uh, they're, they're both are properly understood. And if you have any specific questions still, 
please meet me in my office after the class or uh, during my office hours. And my office hour, remember, is the hour when I'm in the office. So that means it is not limited to only two hours or three hours per week. Whenever you see me in the office, just jump in. My door is always open and ask questions, all right? Um, yes, talking about the major characteristics of the Middle East, we talk about some major, major things such as, I mean, what make actually the Middle East really uh, uh, a very great uh, source of concern in many directions and for, for a variety of reasons, one of which, of course, uh, unarguably is the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, the largest energy resources. Uh, Middle East was always there before it was even identified as Middle East. Uh, middle, according to what, of course, uh, depends. Uh, and therefore, the name itself is, is kind of new. It's not something that existed for centuries. It's there for maybe over the last two uh, centuries, etc. Um, artificial state boundaries, actually, again, it is, it, it's an affair of uh, the 20th century, or the, starting from the early 20th century. Uh, the Ottoman uh, heritage actually was part, sort of uh, uh, shared among uh, great powers of the period. We said political instability. Uh, there are certain factors that lead to this instability, one of which, of course, is ethnic diversity. Um, et diverse ethnic groups, uh, different religions, and of course the conflict, which is unfortunately unavoidable among uh, religions, Ju Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and within uh, Islam, Sunni, Shia sects, etc. Uh, of course, the the presence of extra regional countries, and especially during the Cold War years, the the, the super po superpower intervention did not help in any way uh, in bringing stability, and rather, on the contrary, it brought instability to the region. Well, maybe there was this uh, Cold War stability at the systemic level, uh, which was uh, pretty much depending on the presence of uh, highly advanced nuclear weapons capabilities in the hands of both superpowers, namely the Soviet Union and the United States. And it has a different logic, and it has entirely different uh, uh, conditions peculiar to the two superpowers, which actually help maintain uh, a certain degree of stability. But things could go out of hand any time, and that was a very tense period. But the stability that existed between the two superpowers did not necessarily reflect uh, to the relations uh, in the Middle East, and we have seen much of instability in the Middle East, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, sort of uh, when compared to other parts of some other parts of the world. There were some other regions, such as the subcontinent. I mean, the India, Pakistan, uh, or also in Latin America, uh, there were some regions which were highly inst instable. Um, what else? Authoritarian, totalitarian regimes. Well. These are, again, pretty much the characteristics of the Middle East. Uh, we, we do not necessarily think of democracies or advanced democracies, such as the ones that exist in Europe, North America, and we can also talk about uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. These are democratic nations. But when we think of the Middle East, the first thing that comes to our mind is the presence of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. And, of course, these are not regimes where you can advance individual liberties, pretty much. And therefore, I would say, unfortunately, we should hope, we should keep our hopes alive that this thing will change, but it will take time because of all the other characteristics and the ones that we have not mentioned yet. So therefore, Middle East is not an easy region. And for, for many years, up, uh, to, especially d during the Cold War years, after the Second World War, until, I would say, the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union and the, or the collapse of the bipolar system, uh, by and large, uh, Turkey, both out of necessity, because of its uh, role that it was supposed to play within the Western camp, 
being a member of NATO, and also because of some uh, other reasons, political reasons, uh, economic reasons, and otherwise, Turkey dissociated itself or alienated itself from the Middle East. Turkey did not consider itself as part of the Middle East and tried to stay as far away as possible and as long as possible away from Middle Eastern politics. I keep uh, saying this in my classes. Uh, I think it was Wahid Alefoğlu when I read in either in his memoirs or in one of the interviews back in the 80s, uh, uh, possibly somewhere in one of the daily papers, he described the Middle East, uh, the politics in the Middle East as the sand hills in the desert, and that they would change every day. And he, like many other Turkish diplomats and politicians or foreign policy analysts, uh, preferred to believe that Turkey, I mean, it, one should stay away from this highly dynamic uh, situation, which Turkey did not have much in common. And therefore, Turkey preferred to stay away from uh, the Middle East, stay clear from Middle Eastern or the conflicts in the Middle East. But since the end of the Cold War, and more specifically, because of the Iraq war uh, in 1991, or because of Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990, and the events that unfolded uh, after this, since then, Turkey found itself unavoidably uh, part of the Middle East politics. And over the last 10 years or so, because of, again, necessity, and also it is a deliberate choice, as far as I can see, of the Turkish government officials to get involved in the Middle East more than, uh, uh, more than the, uh, the, the sort of the Cold War period, much more than the Cold War period. During the Cold War period, there's only short episodes of Turkey's interest in the Middle East, such as um, the Baghdad Pact of 1954-55, and uh, which lived uh, pretty short. And uh, there are also some uh, relations with uh, some uh, countries, such as Israel, which again depended pretty much on the other circumstances, as we will talk about uh, toward the end of the semester. All right, so this is not the Middle East. We still have some space left, and there are many other issues that we can talk about. One particular issue, I mean, you're taking Middle East security course. And this is, since this is an elective course, uh, one of the motivations behind your taking this course must be to learn what the secu security situation is and will be in the Middle East. And when we talk about security, what is it that we talk about or we should think about? Yes? What was, what was your name? Meltem. Meltem, okay, Meltem. Okay, uh, well, this is something that we talk more frequently and quite intensively uh, after the 9-11. But prior to 9-11, there were also some other terrorist attacks in the region, such as uh, in Yemen, in other countries. So uh, presence of, let's say, non-state actors. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, one of my graduate students completed his dissertation, his master thesis, on uh, terrorist Al Qaeda, actually, and the debate. Well, maybe not a debate, but the discussion at one point of his uh, thesis defense was whether we should make any distinction between a terrorist organization and a non-state actor, because for some people. Well, I would also you know, sign up for that list. It doesn't make too much difference if we talk about a non-state actor or a terrorist organization, so long as we don't, of course, talk about in multinational corporations, because there are some books, some publications, which make this distinction between non-state actors and uh, as, which are seen as terrorist organizations or organizations of concern for secu security reasons and also multinational corporations or some other sort of institutions worldwide as non-state actors. Of course, 
every actor in the international arena which are not actually, uh, which is not a state, may be counted as a non-state actor. But here, in a, for this course, we talk about terrorist organizations or such organizations that use violence, arms, or armed attack as a way and means of uh, you know achieving their purposes. And therefore, uh, I would rather prefer to use non-state actor, which is more encompassing, which includes uh, a bigger number of entities, because the word terrorist organization for some people may not be that sympathetic, may not be uh, that much sort of uh, appealing to their sort of uh, expectations. But what I mean here is, a, is an actor which does not actually dare uh, using force or uh, violence against innocent people, civilians, or, or unarmed groups. Okay, so one particular characteristic, again, unfortunately today of the Middle East, is the presence or, according to some, abundance or widespread nature of non-state actors. What else can we talk about? Yes? And your name was? Could you? Dilara. Dilara, okay, sorry. I, I keep forgetting some names, but I will get used to it over the course of the semester. Dilara, Meltem, all right, go ahead. Maybe we can accept the nuclear proliferation such as Iran's nuclear activity and Saudi Arabia's uh, buying weapons from USA nowadays. Well, that actually, the one, that, that is the thing that I was expecting to hearing since from the beginning. I mean, there is possibly not any other region in the world where armament is so intensive, so, so high. And this is an overly armed region. And the most recent deal, well, actually, maybe the, the deal might be recent, but there was for so many years discussion about it between the United States and Saudi Arabia for the sale of $60 billion, $60 billion worth uh, sale uh, of arms to Saudi Arabia will make the region even more armed. So uh, heavy armament, let's put that way, Well, when we talk about heavy armament, we basically talk about, or the first thing that comes to our mind is the, what we call conventional weapons. Conventional weapons, and there are also non-conventional weapons, which are weapons of mass destruction. So also the spread of, let's say, of, or what we call proliferation. Oh, sorry for that. Proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, WMD. Well, conventional weapons and non-conventional weapons are two different categories. And my students who may have taken courses from me should be familiar with this distinction as to why there is this category of conventional weapons and non-conventional weapons. Who, would, who could explain to us? or who would volunteer an explanation as to what the difference is between conventional weapons and or conventional category of weapons and unconventional or non-conventional weapons. Okay? Good job, I remember, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, conventional weapons, like a traditional weapon, like uh, guns and everything, but... Can you speak up? I'm not sure if your friends at the back seat can hear you. Okay, MBC, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Okay, fine. I mean, Guljihan said something right, but somewhat incomplete. I mean, it is not, uh, of course, uh, wrong to define as such that is, or to make this distinction between conventional and non-conventional weapons. Uh, conventional weapons are the so-called traditional weapons, and non-conventional non weapons are relatively speaking, newer, fine. But why is it that they are called conventional and non-conventional? I mean, here, if you were to solve a mathematics problem, so 
so you go, and, uh, you have nothing here. <laughs> Well, I wish life would be that easy to get rid of all these weapons. But, so what is it that makes one weapon uh, as a conventional weapon and the other is non-conventional? What, what, is, what is the significance of this term, conventional? About them again? Well, to me, it is legitimate to have any sort of weapon. I hate weapons, and that's why I'm teaching disarmament. But, uh, for instance, the United States has nuclear weapons. So does Russia, um, United Kingdom, France, and China. They are all legal tenders of these weapons. I mean, they have the legitimate right to have these weapons in their arsenals according to the uh, Treaty of the no on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, MPT. It is legitimate. Well, to me, it's illegitimate. Fine. Or chemical weapons, biological weapons conventions prohibit states from uh, developing these weapons or stockpiling them, using them, and of course producing them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this is not the the boundary between conventional and non-conventional. Legitimacy is something that sounds uh, similar to what I expect uh, from it to here. Bishra, I think you guys, I can read from your face that you have the correct answer right now. I'm not 100%. You don't have to be. I mean, that's why you come here. Non commercial weapons, uh, if the state owns them, it's seen as a threat. So it's not. Well, yeah, threat perception, of course, uh, threat perception from non conventional weapons or weapons of mass destruction. The perception is much higher and much more serious when compared to conventional weaponry, but there are some conventional capabilities which may be as destructive or dangerous as non-conventional weapons. This is not that, I mean, this, this categorization is correct in itself, but not the one that I expect to hear. You should understand uh, the, the difference between conventional and non-conventional. Ibrahim? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, please. <laughs> And um, by the way, this is, uh, please give two signatures if you are here in the first hour. And, and so if you're not, just, just one. Okay. The, okay, I mean, so we're getting somewhere. This is important. This is important. Your friend said conventional weapons have a limited effect, so to speak. And non-conventional weapons may have wider effect, or may have effect on a wider area. So this is one reason behind this sort of a categorization or distinction between non-conventional and conventional. Can you just use your uh, uh, intellect a uh, little bit more? Gil Jihan again, yes? All right. Fine. Some other thoughts, Amelia? Any suggestions? Um, you don't have to be sure to make any suggestions. I'm not sure, actually, but like the main difference for me would be like stuff that you can also uh, get in different countries versus like manufacturing in our country. Well, in some respects, some uh, manufacturing non-conventional weapons, such as chemical and biological weapons, may not be as difficult as difficult as some conventional weapons, which may be really highly sophisticated. This is not the reason between the distinction. Again, uh, I think conventional weapons are supposed to be not supposed to be used on civilians, whereas uh, non-conventional weapons might be used on civilians. Well, what I mean, since they are uh, weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. you cannot uh, prevent killing civilians. Yeah, we're, we're getting somewhere even closer. Uh, any, Shuai, any suggestions? All right, based on your, your Sophia? Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't really know, but maybe like conventional weapons are sort of more acceptable to use in warfare, whereas non-conventional weapons are considered exactly. more acceptable. Yeah, this is, this is, I mean, in the culmination of what your friend said comes down to this. I mean, just 
when you have doubts about the meaning of something, this is something that I learned during my uh, prep school years at Boston University, you have to divide the word into its sort of a constituents. And here, what do we have? Conventional. What is a convention? When a convention, well, there is this Hilton Convention Center, meaning Hilton, uh, there is this meeting center, or where people meet, that means where people come together. So conventional, there is a certain degree of uh, understanding or common understanding of uh, something. So meaning, conventional weapons are weapons that are seen, accepted, agreed upon as weapons. We like it or not, there have been weapons since uh, or throughout the human history, and there will be weapons in the future, so long as humanity exists on the surface of the Earth. We hope forever. But, and there is at least an understanding that some weapons are, no matter what, how much we agree personally, individual, but there is a great consensus <coughs> about, the, uh, about being weapons as legal or legitimate instruments of warfare. War is the ultimate or maybe the last sort of a uh, way or mean of resolving differences. And diplomacy, politics, and other ways and means need to be resorted first, uh, and, but, uh, or, or, or attempted first. But at least there is an ag sort of agreement upon the uh, certain weapons such as tanks, such as rifles, such as artilleries, uh, aircraft, whatever, or navy ships, these, these are uh, things that are accepted as weapons. But non-conventional weapons actually suggest that there is no agreement upon whether these could be categorized as weapons. Because as your friend said, their effect may go beyond the intention. A military commander in the battlefield knowing the capacity or the sort of weapons categories it, he or she has, uh, then may decide on how much uh, weapon or how much force or power to use in order to get a political objective. Because wars are just uh, instruments of getting or achieving a certain political objective. But, and you can limit the scope of uh, destruction, because conventional weapons do not necessarily have far-reaching sort of effects. But once nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons are used, depending on many conditions, and of course depending on the amount of or number of these weapons used, it is virtually impossible, literally impossible, to limit the effects of these weapons. Well, there's definitely almost no way of defending one against the extreme uh, degree of uh, destruction of nuclear weapons. And biological and chemical weapons are such chemical or biological agents that are spread into the atmosphere, into the air, and uh, depending on the climatic or environmental or meteorological conditions, their effects may go beyond the intentions of the users. And therefore, they may become weapons of mass casualty. They may kill many, many more people than the sort of a political decision makers or meter decision makers may have even intended. So therefore, there is no consensus or there is no convention on whether these could be categorized as weapons. Some people do not accept the, uh, these as weapons, including myself, I always say these are slaughtering devices. Well, I do not like or accept any other weapon system, even they are conventional, but at least I can agree that throughout history and in the future, there was and will be these weapons. But these are different categories, and their effect will go beyond. And, of course, when there are efforts to limit the number of conventional weapons, there are agreements on a bilateral basis or a multilateral basis which aim at stopping the uh, spread or increase in number of even conventional weapons. For instance, there is this conventional forces in Europe agreement 
which was negotiated during the Cold War, and then uh, signed and entered in force after the Cold War between the former Warsaw Pact countries uh, and NATO countries, now, of course, Russia and, uh, and uh, many other countries in Europe and, and in NATO. So, therefore, these are some treaties or agreements which aim at stopping the spread of conventional weapons. Still, they do not necessarily dispute whether these are weapons or not. But when it comes to biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons, and radiological devices, etc., uh, their characteristics of, of being as to whether they are a weapon or not is hotly debated. So therefore, there is this distinction between the two. So I wanted you to understand that when we talk about conventional and non-conventional weapons, we talk about entirely two different categories of weapons. Uh, as I said, regardless of how you approach the issue, uh, non-conventional weapons are chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, and conventional weapons are all the other types of weapons. But of course, there are some uh, in the gray area uh, which may be categorized, which may still be categorized as conventional weapon, but their effects may really be extensive, and uh, such as some laser weapons, for instance, or some other devices uh, which may cause much harm, much damage to, I mean, uh, civilians or some institutions or some networks of communications or other things. Of course, one great uh, danger, threat is, of course, not only these being in the hands of states, it is still and already a threat. Countries, um, and there are approximately 200 countries in the world, and almost all of them, with few exceptions maybe, have big or small armies, uh, uh, navies, air forces. Uh, of course, uh, they have uh, endowed all their sort of uh, uh, military institutions with as many weapons as, as they could, depending on their financial capabilities or threat perceptions, etc. But still, even though uh, there have been wars, and most likely there will be other wars in the future between or among states, but these are actually still being very, very significant and very threatening, but not the most threatening uh, issues. What is the most or all the more threatening is, of course, the probability of these weapons falling into, into the hands of non-state actors, which do not necessarily refrain from or may not refrain from using these not only against the armies of some states, but also against the civilian populations. As we have seen on 9-11, for instance, the targets were deliberately chosen as civilian targets, one of which, of course, was Pentagon. There are some civilian people working there. But more importantly, uh, the World Trade Centers, of course, no one could just identify this or the two towers as being military targets. These were uh, purely uh, civilian sort of uh, targets. So therefore, the, the threat of uh, use of weapons of mass destruction in terrorist hands is something that really scares many people. Uh, well, not everybody is scared uh, at the same degree. Well, I can see that. I, I can tell you this based on my research and also my observations because I'm uh, in these circles uh, quite uh, often. But still, at least from my personal uh, perspective, and as we will see throughout the semester based on our readings and discussions, and also, uh, in, in, in some cases, some of the countries that you will be uh, representing, uh, this threat is uh, all the more uh, sort of uh, emphasized. For instance, Israel is one of the countries which is much more concerned with the probability of a terrorist attack with uh, weapons of mass destruction, not only the ones that have been used so far in, uh, in, in attacks in cities like Haifa, Tel Aviv, etc. So, therefore, what we mentioned here, heavy armament or spread of or proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, again, there are some other things that we should not forget about the Middle East, um, especially with respect to the secure dimension. What else can we say as we 
proceed with the characteristics of the Middle East. Yes, your name was? Mert Klitsch, yes, go ahead. Muslim Brotherhood or Arab Brotherhood? Muslim. Okay. Um, ideologies uh, different. All right. Um, Zionism slash uh, who is the founder of Muslim Brotherhood? Any idea? Egypt is the country, yes. Tough. Okay, read your text, please. <laughs> read your text. Every information you need about Middle East can be found in the reading assignments that I left uh, to the reserve section. Um, I think I said this before, but um, uh, let me repeat for those who may have somehow missed or were not here. It is very difficult to find a book on Middle East politics or Middle Eastern politics because there are basically two groups, I, I mean basically and not exclusively, but there are basically two major groups uh, who are publishing on Middle Eastern affairs. One of course looks at the issue from let's say Zionist perspective or from Israeli perspective, not necessarily Zionist, not all of them Zionist, uh, and the other is looking at the issue from Arab perspective and sometimes overlooking some facts, figures, or overemphasizing or underestimating or underemphasizing certain things. So it is highly difficult to find a balanced book. And as, a, as, a, as an instructor, as a professor teaching this subject, I think I feel like I should be in a position to not to impose any particular ideology or any particular view upon you and your, sort of, your mind, you should be the ones who will find your own ways uh, in this conflict. So what I'm trying to, to do actually in terms of assigning reading material is to find the ones that in my personal judgment uh, reflect the situation to the extent possible as objectively as possible. So therefore William Cleveland's book is the one that I found and now lost. I don't know where it is gone. I, I can't find my book anyway, but I have it, these copies and, and these are available in the reserve. But it is the one that I found quite balanced in its approach. It doesn't have any concern as to you know, siding with one of the parties and uh, sort of uh, uh, opposing the other party. It, it is trying to present as much objective information as possible and still make some comments, but yet leaves to the reader to make the ultimate judgment about how he or she sort of uh, sees the situation in the Middle East. Uh, with respect to um, the different ideologies, yes, uh, Zionism is, is an ideology to some extent, or is a way of life. It's, it is something that has culminated in what today we know as Israel. And uh, Muslim Brotherhood is again something that emerged, yes, in the Egyptian territory, but has a widespread appeal and it go, went beyond the Middle East today, especially after the end of the Cold War rivalry. The Cold War actually uh, was a period which, in a sense, blocked the emergence or uh, coming to surface of many other uh, sort of ideological confrontations. This does not mean that they did not exist and they just emerged after the Cold War. They were there, but the heavyweight uh, politics of the Cold War, let's say, uh, in a sense, uh, like pop-up blockers on the, uh, in, the, in your computers, uh, they blocked them from coming to the surface. The situation in the Balkans, for instance, when in 1980, uh, Josef Prostito passed away when he died. There were some commentators who suggested, who forecasted that Yugoslavia could not remain as one and that it would be a matter of time for Yugoslavia to dismember, to just sort of uh, uh, fall apart. 
But because of the Cold War balances and, and some a certain degree of systemic uh, structural developments, it stayed as one until the end of the Cold War. The same applies to the Middle East. Some conflicts, big or small, could have erupted and uh, could have spread to, to, to the wider region during the Cold War even. But that was, as we will discuss possibly on Friday, uh, because this, this, this kind of even small conflicts or bigger conflicts could escalate into a bigger, even bigger conflict that would you know, bring in the two superpowers, namely the United States and Soviet Union, they were somehow blocked at their earlier stages. So therefore, when we look at, as I mentioned, when it seemed like there was a systemic stability to some extent uh, during the Cold War period, some regional conflicts were somewhat blocked from escalating to bigger conflicts. Well, what it, whether that was a good thing or bad thing, it is up to your interpretation. It was a good thing in some sense because they did not result in hot conflicts and people did not die. But maybe it was not that such a good thing because some of the differences were not resolved and so long as, so long as the differences exist, they sort of keep the, or they, they preserve their potential of uh, uh, growing into a bigger conflict and they sort of uh, uh, have bigger roots, may not come to the surface, but once accumulated over a period of time, then they come to the surface being as a bigger conflict. So maybe uh, the 9-11 trauma that most of the world uh, experienced uh, was experienced because what in a sense motivated these people to uh, sacrifice their own lives and, and, and to sort of exercise uh, or to sort of execute this uh, event w might have been a result of this accumulation in the Arab world or in the Islamic world which may have been somehow uh, controlled uh, at lower levels had this conflict may have been uh, had this conflict been sort of a to some extent uh, uh, fought or to some extent discussed uh, at, when they were at the, their earlier stages. All right, well, actually, this is not it. This is not uh, uh, all about the Middle East, but major characteristics of the Middle East are this. But, and we will discuss, uh, let me just for one last second, uh, I will send you this um, as an email attachment after discussing in the classroom. Oops, Sanyo. Well, um, 20 more seconds. Actually, you must have seen this, uh, the, the PowerPoint file, where I will some extent, to some extent, summarize uh, a number of chapters that are aside from uh, Cleveland's book. But it is essential that you read this. Otherwise, some parts may not be fully understood. Yeah, this will come, and we will go on for a number of uh, issues here, like the state of affairs in the Middle East right after the Cold War period, sorry, uh, World War II period, and of course, Israel, Nasserism, the wars between Arabs and Israel. What, what is more important than the wars themselves? Of course, people have lost our, their lives, and this is therefore very, very important. But their political implications, and what happened after, for instance, the 1948-49 war, right after Israel was created? What kind of transformations in the Middle East this war has caused, and what kind of implications the 67 war and also the uh, Yom Kippur war in 1973, not only across the region but also across the world. So therefore, we will go on with the, the discussions, but I strongly recommend to you to at least come through, just you know, familiarize yourselves by trying to quickly read chapters. These are very easy reading, reading chapters, not difficult, not detailed. Jargon is not used extensively, and simple sentences are used by the author. So, and your English must be more than necessary, more than sufficient.
to understand everything. So please make sure you understand. And uh, for some basic characteristics of the Middle East, I also recommend uh, you to go over several pages, uh, not more than 15 or so pages, from uh, this book, actually, Hindabush and Etisami's book. All right? Okay, I'll see you on Friday. Thank you for coming.